Hi, my name is Blake Levine. I am a bipolar expert and author of the book, Being Bipolar. Today I'm going to talk about how you or someone you love that is facing this mental illness can figure out ways to improve your life. In the beginning, I want to share about what I went through and how I ended up being able to learn how to master bipolar disorder. My story starts as a very young man growing up in New York City. Uh, my parents met when they were at a very different place in their lives. My mom was 16 and my father was 32. She was living in Ibiza, which is a beautiful island in Spain. They got together and they ended up moving to New York City and started a relationship. They had a lot of fun and exciting times, but sadly things would not work out really well. They started to use drugs in the fight and really had challenges that ruined the relationship. I started experiencing at a very young age them arguing and fighting and in fact my first memory is as a young boy watching them beat each other up and I remember hiding in the closet and feeling just so upset knowing that my two parents were having such problems. Um, they ended up getting uh, divorced and it was a really, really hard and difficult time and my dad is a lawyer which made it even more difficult for my mom to end the relationship. They had a very uh, tough time at the divorce and some things were said by my mom which really infuriated my dad. Uh, within a few months from the divorce, my dad would see me on the weekends and my mom would see me during the week, but he was very angry. Uh, we one day were walking in New York City and I was walking down the street with my mother and her friend. All of a sudden a car came up, a big guy got out of it with my dad, knocked my mom to the ground, picked me up and threw me into the car. For the next 10 months I was kidnapped by my dad. We went to South Carolina and I was unable to see her and I was about three years old at the time but I remember wondering where is my mom? Is she okay? What is going on? Why aren't I able to have her in my life? I would beg my dad to let me see her and he would say okay we can call her and once a month we would give her a call and she'd be screaming and crying, Blake where are you? I want to know what happened. Um, I'd like you to come back and all I could say is mom I'm in the greenhouse down the street come see me. Unfortunately she had no idea where the greenhouse was and was very, very uh, so uh, sad and upset at this time. In fact, during the 10 months that I was gone, she literally, her life almost ended. She lost about 40 pounds and she's already a very thin woman. Uh, she thought about ending her life and just losing her three-year-old son was such a painful and difficult situation. Um, towards the end of that 10-month time, she had hired a detective and was running out of money but she still kept the hope alive that one day she would be reunited with her son. As the money was ending, she ended up on one of the last days going to a preschool near where my dad used to work. She went there and was able to uh, find me. She took me out of the school, and I remember the police coming and saying, you know, why did you take this kid? And she said, well, in fact, he had been kidnapped, and she showed paperwork, and we were reunited. And the good news was, from that point on, my mom and dad decided to work things out. They said, there's no reason to be hateful, and even though my dad did something so horrible, it was really not worth any of them, you know, ruining each other's lives. Uh, my mom also feared that my dad would hurt her, and this was one of the reasons why she chose to make up with him. And I ended up seeing my dad on the weekend and my mom during the week. Now, as you can imagine, for any young person, going through such trauma and challenges at such an early age really you know, played a big impact. Many kids my age were living in a town and they were feeling comfortable and they were starting to learn normal developmental things. They were making friends, they were doing activities, they were in school. I had this feeling of such a high level of insecurity, not knowing if I was normal, feeling as if I was weird, and never really feeling good enough. So what I did to mask all of those emotions and feelings was I started to try to accomplish things. I wanted to have something that I could be doing that would say, hey, you know, he's successful at this, so it makes up for all the things that I lack. I ended up going to visit my dad, and we started out collecting uh, baseball cards, and it was really fun going and collecting these cards, and eventually, I went to a game at Chase Stadium and I met uh, Daryl Strawberry and I got him to sign an autograph for me. It was so thrilling. I consider it almost like what it's like to have an orgasm. That was my feeling when I got to meet a baseball player who I really looked up to and was successful and such a talent. I ended up doing with my dad and would go to games and I would get baseball autographs from some of the greatest players. One day I found out that uh, many of the players that play the Yankees or the Mets stay at this hotel called the Grand Hyatt and I went there 
and started to collect autographs from the different players. It was just really fun and me and my dad had a great time. Over the next few years in New York City, I would go and meet lots of famous people. I ended up amassing the largest collection of any young person. A few of the names of people I met were Michael Jackson, Madonna, Tom Cruise, uh, Paul McCartney, seven United States presidents, Frank Sinatra, Audrey Hepburn, and you name it, pretty much everyone that was notable at the time. Now, during those years, things started to change. Instead of being an awkward kid that really maybe wasn't stable, people started to look at me as a prodigy. I had a lot of energy, I was really ambitious, I was able to network, and it was really starting to look like my life would do uh, very well. In fact, I started to get media attention, sharing about the stories and experiences meeting different famous people. I appear on Entertainment Tonight and CNN and the Maury Povich Show and a lot of other places talking about these experiences. In fact, at 14, I was asked to write a book and I published OK Dad, You Can Take the Picture, A Young Man's Quest for Autographs of the Famous. And I talked about all the fun, exciting experiences meeting these people along with pictures. And during that time, people didn't notice that anything was wrong. I had lots of energy and really was channeling it into things I was passionate about, but I was good in school, I had friends, and life seemed okay. The next year, things would really dramatically change. I moved from uh, Marlboro, New Jersey, to a town in Long Island, and I never really felt comfortable. The kids would pick on me on the bus, they would start fights, they would call me names, they would punch me and really try to put me down, and I went from going living in a safe community where I really felt supported to not really feeling comfortable at all. Then, one night, I felt a pain in my head. I described it like I was bleeding in my brain. And I went to my mom and said, Mom, Mom, you know, I really, I need to go to the doctor or the hospital. My, my brain is bleeding. And she was very concerned. She called up our primary care doctor and said, Listen, he's probably fine. It's probably just some type of fear. Let him go to sleep. Give him, you know, an aspirin or a Tylenol and call me tomorrow. I kept persisting. I kept saying, I'm dying, I'm dying, I'm dying, and this went on for hours. And eventually my mom decided to take me to the hospital. We went to uh, an emergency room at one of the Long Island hospitals near our house, and when I went there, um, they talked to me and they discussed about all the things I was doing, promoting my book and um, you know, talking to all these celebrities and doing all this stuff, and they could tell that I really was not stable. They said to my mom, we think Blake might have some other type of illness, something is wrong with his brain, we want to keep him in the psychiatric unit overnight. And I'll never forget the feeling as they walked me down the hallway into a locked unit. They put me in a room, my mother said goodbye and she started crying as she walked out of there and knew that her 15 year old son would stay in that unit. Within a few weeks I was diagnosed with bipolar 1. Uh, they said that a lot of the behaviors and things I had done illustrated having mania and that I was in fact in a manic episode. They prescribed me medicine and for the next couple weeks I was in the hospital and met all types of different people struggling from emotional issues. A few weeks later they would release me and I would go back into uh, the community but I really wasn't stable. The medicine that they gave me was not working and within a few weeks from then I would go into another hospital. Over the next two years there were five psychiatric hospitalizations. I had uh, things happen that many people would uh, be upset about. I had hallucinations and delusions. I remember one time in a psychiatric hospital I believed that the patients were celebrities. The overweight guy was John Candy. The woman with red hair was Julia Roberts. The gay person was George Michael. Of course none of this was true but it was a delusion that I was experiencing. Um, another time I was in New York City and I went to the top of the Empire State Building. Um, I was researching how to fly and my parents were so fearful that I would try to jump off a building in an attempt to fly. Uh, because of all these reasons, I was in and out for those two years of five different hospitals and my mom spent a lot of money and went to the top bipolar expert in Manhattan. He looked at her and the file on me and all the things that had went on and said, listen, uh, your son will probably never finish high school, he'll never have a job, he'll never be able to get married, he'll never be able to work. Just accept that a group home or a permanent psychiatric hospitalization is his future. Now my mother who had lost me to a kidnapping as a young child wasn't going to accept that her son who had done so much and had been doing so well in his life that my time and life you know, living as a successful person was over. She continued to do whatever she could, reading every single book and article and all the things that were out there that 
discuss and educate about bipolar disorder. She found a psychiatrist who she spoke with, and the woman whose name is Dr. Amy Kareen said, listen, I do think there is a chance that Blake Levine could, you know, build himself back up, and with the proper medicine and taking a slow and steady approach, he could one day, you know, be able to live a successful life. She found a medicine at the time which was uh, new called Zyprexa and Depakote, and that's the combination she put me on. Within a few weeks, my thinking became calm, and I realized that I really had almost lost everything in my life. I knew how hard it was to be in and out of hospitals and to, you know, lose my freedom. I prayed to God, even though I wasn't so religious before that, and I asked for a second chance. Um, I decided to take small and slow steps to rebuild my life, and I said to myself, maybe one day I could go out and accomplish the things that I had thought about before becoming sick. I ended up going to a special school uh, provided by uh, the, the city, and I started to get back, and I ended up finishing high school. I applied to college and was able to go to college and finish. Um, in fact, I was able to go to graduate school and get my master's degree in social work, and I started working with other people facing emotional issues. I'm so happy to say that since then I've also been married, and uh, for the last uh, number of years, 10 years I've been with my wife, we've been married for seven. We have a four-year-old daughter who's doing amazing and is the most beautiful and special girl that you could ever imagine, and we have another child on the way due in a couple months. So what I want to share with you, and the reason I talk about my personal story is I want you to know there is hope. And if someone you love, whether it's a family member or a friend um, or even yourself, have bipolar disorder, it doesn't mean that it's the end. Now, I talked a little bit about this, but I want to give you tips and techniques and tools that have allowed me to live a successful life. Because when you were diagnosed with a mental illness, it doesn't go away. I wish that you could just take pills or do something and it's gone and you, know, you, you would never have to deal with it. But the facts are, when you are given a diagnosis for the rest of your life, you have to work on it. But together, with some of the tools I provide today, you can learn how to make progress and to make your life better. And the outcome doesn't have to be hospitalizations for the rest of your life or not being able to have friends or not function. And what I've become is a uh, bipolar author and coach and social worker. And I help other people that live with this condition and I work to give them out so by making this for you today, I want you to be able to see some of the lessons and tools that will help you. I want to first start with accepting having a diagnosis. Many times I've worked with people and they feel angry. They get diagnosed with bipolar, whether it's bipolar 1 or bipolar 2 or a different type, and they don't want to accept it. Saying to themselves that they have a mental illness is very hard. In fact, many times people are teenagers when they're diagnosed, and it's so hard for them to look and say, you know what, I, I was okay before, I was living a normal life, I got sick, and now I have a mental illness that I have to deal with for the rest of my life. The good news is, that doesn't have to be the end. When you have this diagnosis, it is not the end of your life. What it means is you have to take steps to work towards recovery and getting yourself healthy. Now, by accepting it, what you're doing is allowing yourself to take proactive steps. When you have a psychiatrist, which is always recommended, they can work with medication to help you and to give you something that will balance your brain. Often what happens for those of us with bipolar disorder is we are not in balance. When we go towards mania, we can do things like spending lots of money, uh, not sleeping for days at a time, gambling well beyond you know our means. If we're a man or a woman that's usually cautious with sexual partners, we might end up having sex with tons of people. Um, there's a lot of different types of ways that you can be manic. And the problem with that, because it is fun and it is exciting and you have lots of energy and you're really, you know, during that time feeling alive, but the problem is there's always an end. There's always either a crash where you end up becoming very depressed or where you do things that are damaging. I've met people that have bipolar that are in a faithful relationship and they end up having uh, extramarital relations and it ruins the relationship that they were in. So for all those reasons, being manic is not a good, healthy, sustainable thing. On the other side, there's depression. Now what happens with that is people end up losing interest in the things they're passionate about. It might be being with their friends or going to their job or school 
or being able to get out of bed. Many times people with depression sleep for hours and hours at a time and they lose the passion and excitement that they've had before. So one of the ways you can deal with bipolar is accepting that you have it and admitting, have you had manic episodes? Have you had depressive episodes? Because those are signs and symptoms that you do have this illness. Now, many times people ask me, how do I get diagnosed? If I think I might have it or I want to learn more, who's the right person? Well, that's a terrific question, and the easy answer is psychiatrists are usually the best uh, way to figure this out. They are trained as medical doctors, which means that they're different than psychologists or social workers or life coaches. They have a medical uh, degree and medical license, and they're able to give diagnosis. And what they will do is look at all the different factors in your life, the stress that's happened, the situations that happened, the degree of mania and depression, and they will give you a diagnosis. And one of the main things about it is it allows you to know what it is you're facing. Because when we get these different symptoms, we need to know, is it bipolar? Is it depression? Is it anxiety? Is it just situations that have happened in our lives? Maybe we're, you know, haven't been sleeping for a week. Whatever it is, you want to be able to look at it and figure it out. If you don't take the right steps to get diagnosed, it makes it even harder. Another terrific tool is learning how to get support around you. Now, I work as a coach, and many of the people that come to talk to me really want someone in their corner. What I do is I'll help them, I'll listen to them, I'll provide answers, I'll let them bounce ideas off of me, we'll set goals, and we'll work towards being successful. In your own life, who can you find that will be that role for you? Now, you might have family members, whether it's brothers or sisters, your parents, um, are those people there to be supportive to you? Now, sometimes you have family that are great, they're really actively involved in helping you, they wanna work with you, and listen to you and guide you and then sometimes family can't take it there might be too much stress in their own life maybe they're not stable enough and for all those reasons you have to figure out who are the support people in your life you want to build around you a team of people that can help you now there's also a great uh, group of organizations out there two that i want to mention one is called the dbsa that's the depression and bipolar support alliance and what they do is have chapters all throughout the country and they offer um, support groups where you can go and meet other people whether it's those that have bipolar or other mental illnesses or uh, family members of people that uh, live with this and there you can get support and meet others that want to help you and everyone goes with one main purpose which is to help and support each other there's also another group called NAMI which is the National Alliance on Mental Illness and they are also there to help families and individuals with mental illness you can go to both their websites and learn about all the different things that they offer most of which are free so when you start taking steps like this going out there being part of a support group meeting other people it's really really helpful. I've met many individuals that live with bipolar and they have no support. They have no friends. They don't talk to many people. They stay in their house. In fact, I was talking to a client today and he was saying that before we had our first session, for many months he wouldn't even leave the house. He would stay there. He'd only watch television and he really felt alone and isolated. And he said to me that he would fear that if he went out, people would look at him like he's different or judge him or make him feel uncomfortable. So I want to say to you that if you're someone that feels awkward or you're feeling like you don't have anyone to kind of be around, go out there and go to a support group, meet other people, know that you're not the only one that's living with this, and find others that can help you and guide you, and just like um, Alcoholics Anonymous is a phenomenal way for those with addictions to meet others and to know that they're not the only one, that type of group support is very, very helpful if you live with a mental illness. Another great tool is taking care of yourself. Now, everyone out there knows that taking exercise and eating well is great. When you have a mental illness, it's even more important. Now, some of the reasons for this are medicines can cause you to gain weight. Uh, I, in my own life, gained, I was very thin as a child before I was diagnosed and gained a, a substantial amount of weight. But in order to counteract that, I try to exercise four or five times a week. I try to eat healthy. I drink lots of water. I try to stay hydrated. All of these things are vital for you because the facts are most of us with mental illness do take medication. We have to deal with the fact that the medicines impact us and you know a lot of us take them for the rest of our lives. So we have to figure out ways to counteract 
and keep ourselves healthy. Now, some of the key things are knowing what your triggers are. I know in my own life, if I have a big bag of Cool Ranch Doritos or Oreo cookies in the house, if it comes about 9, 30, 10 o'clock at night, I'll go in there and have way too many. And I've learned that it's not healthy for me to do that, so I'll keep them out of the house. And that allows me to figure out other things to snack on. I might have rice cakes or um, light popcorn or things like that. In your own life, what can you do to limit the excessive amount of food? And the problem is food is something we all need. You know, if you have alcohol or drugs or things like that, you can stay away and never do them. We all need to eat. Every one of us needs energy and needs food to be able to have the fuel to live a healthy life. But you have to make good choices. And the problem is, if you do gain a ton of weight and you don't take care of yourself, there's other problems that you can have, such as diabetes and things that really make life harder. So I want to say to you, if you're facing a mental illness, you should go out there and try to take care of yourself. Plus, going and exercising is phenomenal, whether it means you know walking or jogging or lifting weights. It's really, really helpful to get your body stronger. In fact, it also helps your mind. Your mind releases endorphins, and it allows you to really be healthier and more uh, uh, in connection with yourself. So these are some tools that you can use to make um, some good steps. And another thing I want to share about is being able to open up. I've had a lot of clients call me and they say that they've never told anyone this. Maybe they have phobias or paranoias or delusions and they worry what people will think about them. They fear that if they tell their psychiatrist or they tell their counselor at school or they tell their parents, they're going to be judged. The facts are that it's nothing to be ashamed of. If you have these symptoms or these feelings, it doesn't make you a lesser person. It doesn't make you someone that's not good enough. It means you have a medical condition you have to deal with. It's almost as, as if someone had cancer. If someone is diagnosed with cancer, no one looks down on them and says, oh, well, look at them, they have cancer. Or, or oh, wow, they're, you know, they have, their head has to be shaved and, and they have cancer. So people will understand that you have this mental illness. And in fact, when I was first diagnosed about 17 years ago, I remember having this really big anxiety. What are people going to think? Are they going to look at me different? Are they going to judge me? Are they going to put me down? And I was really, really fearful. I was very happy. After a couple months, some of my friends, I went and admitted to them that I had this and they were very supportive. But these days, it's okay to be honest with others about having a mental illness. Here in California, after I wrote my book, Demi Lovato, who's a, a singer who's been on a number of Disney shows. She read the book and she supported it and she's also admitted openly that she has bipolar disorder. Catherine Zeta-Jones, who's a very famous actress married to Michael Douglas, admits that she has bipolar. These are just two of hundreds of people that have done a lot with their life and been successful. So if you do have this diagnosis, it does not mean it's the end of the world. It doesn't mean people are going to judge you. And think of it in this way. You didn't choose to have this. You didn't wake up and say, okay, well, here's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to be bipolar. No, you had to face this. This is something that came into your life. And we have a decision we can make. When something comes into us, we can handle it and deal with it, or we can put it under the rug and pretend it's not there. The problem is when we do that, when we swipe things under the rug and leave them there, they get bigger and worse. And you have a decision to make today. Do you want to take proactive steps to get yourself healthy, to get yourself feeling more able to handle your situations and to lessen your level of stress? So another thing I want to share about is relationships and bipolar disorder. One of the most common questions I get is, can I have a boyfriend, a girlfriend, or a husband or wife if I have bipolar disorder. Well, one of the first things I want to share is in the Alcoholics Anonymous program, they talk about you getting sober and being healthy for a decent amount of time before you start a relationship. And I believe the reason they do that is they want you to be able to handle your own life before you start getting involved with someone else in a relationship. What you can do in order to have good relationships is get yourself healthy. Get on a stable medicine, be in therapy, work on yourself, be able to feel good about who you are. In my own life, I was healthy for about a year. I ended up meeting a girl at a party and we started dating. I remember feeling so nervous and wondering, what if I tell her that I'm bipolar? Is she gonna judge me? Will she end the relationship? And I actually waited three months. We were dating for a while before I actually admitted to her that I had bipolar and I was so nervous and I was thinking, what is she gonna say? And is this gonna be the end? And is she gonna you know, be mad that I waited? And I will never forget her response. She looked at me and she said, Blake, you're a nice person. You treat me really well. We have a lot of fun together. I don't care that you have bipolar. Uh, you're just as normal as anyone else out there and it doesn't matter to me. And literally from that, I felt so alive and so happy 
and we ended up dating for a couple of years. We broke up and we're still friends today. But that first relationship gave me the confidence and the courage to know I could be lovable and I could be in a relationship. I now am married to my wife for many, many years and we have a great relationship. And in fact, I think we have a better relationship than a lot of people without mental illness because I work at it every day. I do my best to treat her kindly, to do both of our responsibilities and to be there for each other and support each other. So if you have bipolar, it doesn't mean you can't go out there and date and have a girlfriend or a boyfriend or a husband or a wife, but you have to take steps and get yourself as healthy as possible. And the good news is many people are accepting. They're willing to be with you if you are a good person. And I encourage you, no matter how healthy or stable you are, start thinking about getting yourself stronger so that you one day can put yourself out there and be with other people and know you don't have to live your life alone or isolated and there are ways to you know, make yourself a little um, healthier before you go out there and start being with other people. There's another lesson that I learned that is really uh, important, and it's one of the vital things I use in my life, and that's having hope. Um, I remember when I was diagnosed and really not stable and had been in and out of hospitals, and that doctor said to my mom, oh, he's going to be in a hospital or a group home forever, and there was a minute there where I was going to lose hope where I was basically going to throw in the towel and say, you know what, I've just been through five hospitalizations, I've been for months at a time, you know, locked in a unit, and I just, you know, everything I had in my life was taken away from me, the success, the book, the friends, the school, everything was gone. And I made the decision that I was going to have hope. Part of that for me was praying and asking God to help me, but having hope allowed me to say, you know what, maybe things could get better. Maybe things can turn around. And that lesson of hope can be used in your life no matter what you experience or what you go through. When you have hope, you can accomplish things. Now people say to me, what does hope do? Does hope solve my problems? Does hope solve all the answers? And the answer is no, but here's what it does. When you attempt to do something, and you get something that happens. Maybe you try to accomplish something, but it doesn't work. Or maybe you do something and it fails. Or maybe someone hurts your feelings. By having hope, you can continue. You can keep pressing forward. And many of the most accomplished and successful people in our world, they were able to keep moving forward in their lives. I like to share this story about Thomas Edison, and he created the light bulb. Now, he has failed thousands and thousands of times before he succeeded, and what he did lit the room that I'm in today. So I want to say to you at the end of this section, have hope and remember that you can keep moving forward, and if you just take the right steps, you can see your life get happier and healthier. Welcome to part two. In this section, I want to share some really fascinating stories of examples of people I've helped and the lessons that have been learned from others that have lived with bipolar disorder and done it in a successful way. I remember a gentleman came to me and he was facing many obstacles in his life. He was having trouble with his job. He felt as if he was working really hard, but he wasn't moving up within the company. He also faced uh, alcoholism and each day would come home and drink in order to calm himself down. And he also, mostly in the springtime, would get very excited and start spending lots of money. He would go down to Atlantic City and gamble, um, and he would also buy lots and lots of lottery tickets. And he said to me, you know, how do I handle all these situations in my life? And what we started to work on was that underneath all of this was a level of insecurity. He didn't feel good enough because when he was a child, his dad kind of put him down. He would say things like, oh, you're not really good enough, or you're never going to amount to anything, or, you know, you're not going to be able to be successful. And even though him and his dad are now closer, he always felt growing up that he was not achieving, you know, what he was capable of. And it's very important to figure out where our emotions come from. Our, oftentimes, our parents do not know how to raise us in the best way. A number of reasons can happen which cause them to not be the best parents. Maybe they had their own addictions. Maybe their parents were hurtful to them or said things or did things to them. Or maybe they just really don't really understand the best ways to take care of you. And one of the most fascinating things I've learned is that you know we get a license to drive a car or to you know work in a specific field or to do something but there's no license to be a parent and there's also no book 
um, that people have to read. People go about it in all different ways. And sometimes by looking into your past and figuring out what's holding you back from moving forward, you can make progress. Now, I understand in my own life, I've seen a lot of challenges I shared with you about the kidnapping and the divorce and the fighting. But in my own therapy and working on it, I realized that I had to let it go. Being angry at my dad or angry at my mom or feeling like the situation was holding power over me, it was stopping me from moving forward. And I determined on my own and with the help of my therapist that letting go of that pain would be better for me. Now, another example is a woman that I was working with and she had a boyfriend that she really cared about. He was very handsome and successful and he was abusive to her. He would be mean to her, he would treat her really poorly and they would have an on and off relationship for many years. She finally ended up breaking up with him but he really had this power over her. She felt as if his you know, energy and the things that he'd done had beaten her up and her spirit was kind of down when she came in to see me. And what I said to her was, you have to choose what you'll allow. Many times men or women are in relationships and they're not treated well or they're hurt or they're put down and it's up to you to say, you know what, I will not accept this. I want to be treated kindly, I want to be um, in a way that's healthy and I want to know that I am good enough. And you deserve to be treated well in your life, whether it's with your friends or your family or relationships. You have to choose what is it you want. And if you see someone that's hurting you, you have to try to work on it with them. And if not, move on. Many of us have a fear, you know, of the unknown. I've met many women that I've done counseling for and they say, well, if I leave, what will happen? Or I don't know if I could get another relationship. There's always someone out there that is looking to find a healthy, nurturing relationship. And it's up to you to say, you know what, I will not accept this. And what I've seen is when we remove the pain and we figure out where the underlying cause is, it makes a very, very big difference. And oftentimes the situations that happen to us as children impact us. And it doesn't mean you've done anything wrong or you're a weak person. It means that you have to deal with it. Therapy is so great because what it allows you to do is make changes. You can work with someone and allow them to help you figure out your own life. And what I do as a life coach is I'm a guide. My job is to guide you to figure out your own situations. I never have the answers. I never provide exactly what you should do. My goal is to help you to understand and for you to determine where you want to go. Who do you want to be? Another situation that comes up a lot is career. People feel stuck. They say, well, you know, my mom says I should be a teacher. She's always telling me I should be a teacher. It's secure. It's stable. But they want to be an actor and they've always dreamed about that. The problem with that is if you go into the acting, you know, it is a, a challenging career and while you're trying to build that up, you're gonna face people that are gonna look at you and say, well, it's hard or not everyone succeeds, but you have to decide what it is you want for your life. I live here in Los Angeles and one of the best parts of being here is many people have come to succeed in their own lives. They've set out to achieve what it is they have in their heart. And I'm not gonna say it's easy or simple or it's an overnight process, but if you'll work on your craft and you're really gifted, whether it's as an actor or a writer or a dancer or a singer, you will see success. I've always wanted to write in addition to the coaching. And I've written a number of books, some I published myself. It took me about 10 years to get my first book published, which is called Beating Bipolar. And it's a great guide for families and individuals that live with the illness. But what kept me going and kept me moving towards it was I really wanted it. And I wanted to see the success happen and I wouldn't give up until it was attained. And in your own life, you should not give up on your dreams and your goals and moving forward. And you can't let situations that come up block you. Unfortunately for all of us as human beings, the last number of years have been challenging. Uh, since the recession hit in 2008, many of the things that were you know, abundant in the U.S. and the world have changed. There aren't as many great jobs available easily. There's not uh, money everywhere as there used to be. So what I want to say to you is this is a reason for you to really build yourself up and get yourself healthy. Because it used to be in the old days, maybe you could just slide by and make a living and be successful. But today you have to work hard. You have to be confident. You have to be able to keep pressing forward. And we all are going to sometimes get situations to knock us down. And if you live with bipolar disorder, it makes it even harder. I just had a call from someone today and they said, here's what I'm going through. I lost my mother. I have a really stressful job, which is very hard. My uh, uh, wife has a mental illness. She lives with depression. And I have three kids. Now, obviously, hearing that, that is so much to face. But by her 
or, and him getting help and working on it, they were able to make the situation better. So when you have support and guidance, it makes things a little easier and a little bit happier. I want to talk in this section about some of the uh, tools that you can use to allow yourself to make progress. One of the most important things I've seen is doing research. Now, many times, you know, I've read a lot of the books about bipolar and articles because obviously this is what I do. But in your own life, you want to become educated and you want to learn about the different things that are out there. There's a great book by Patty Duke um, called, uh, which shares her, called, uh, I think it's called A Girl Called Anna. It's a great book. Um, Kay Redfield Jamison is an expert. She's a psychologist that lives with bipolar disorder. She has a number of books she's written. And when you start to read these things, it allows you to have insight. And I've written my own book because I wanted to share the lessons and stories that have um, impacted my life and will hopefully help you. Because when you take the time to learn about what you're facing, it makes it easier. Now, another uh, situation that's important to figure out is how do you manage money? For many of us, having our finances is a very stressful situation. We might have not that much coming in and lots of things like a phone bill or rent or a house payment. If we have children, we have to sometimes pay for school or camp or um, clothes. There are a lot of things that can be very stressful for almost everyone. When you have a mental illness, it's even tougher. Now, sometimes I think when I work with people, they have to figure out, are they capable of doing it? It doesn't make you a weak person if you cannot manage your finances. Maybe your husband or your wife need to handle it, or your mom or your dad, or you have to outsource to someone like an accountant that can help you. The key thing is admitting what the situation is. If you do have a problem and it's hard to keep balance of your money, get someone to help you. Admit to it that it's not working because what I've seen is many times people rack up large amounts of debt and have not really handled the situation and then it becomes a massive level of stress. If you owe $50,000 and you know you don't have a lot coming in, it's very, very hard to handle, handle it. It's much better to deal with it and say, you know what, I can't you know, deal with all these things. I need to get someone to support me and help me. Another lesson is if you have, you know, things that have happened, maybe you have debt or maybe you, you know, have gotten in trouble with the law, start to say to yourself that you are ready to make a change. You don't have to continue going down that road. You know, life is about choices and you always can make a choice of what you want to do. If you have $50,000 worth of debt, yes, it's challenging and hard, but there's a number of options. You could go bankrupt or you could figure out how to slowly pay it off. You could make a plan to make progress in that. But the key thing is to know that any situation that comes up can be handled if you'll take small and steady steps. I remember when I was first getting healthier, I felt like there was so much to do. Before I was sick, I had written a book, I was on TV shows, I had tons of friends, I was in school, I had so much going on. When I got sick and was ready to rebuild, I had to take small steps. I remember many of my friends were really smart and they were going to Columbia and Harvard and all these great colleges and I had to go to a, a community college. Now, the good news is eventually I was able to finish there and do well and go to a better graduate school, but I had to accept that I wasn't ready for that high level of pressure and stress. In your own life, what are you ready for? Maybe you can take a job two days a week. Maybe you can do dog walking or maybe work in a store or do some computer work. Whatever it is, anything that moves you forward is very helpful. And you have to realize it doesn't make you a weak person. If you can't handle working nine to five, five days a week, that doesn't mean you're a bad person. We all have to look at our lives and our abilities and our talents and figure out what's going to be best for us. Now, many times we feel everyone else is doing something, they're working and we're not capable of that, that you're a lesser person. That's not the case at all. And in fact, I've met many people with bipolar that are on disability and are unable to work. And that's okay too if that's something that you need in order to survive and take care of yourself. And a lesson that I learned from someone that was helping me was really, really important. I used to meet different people and I'd see sometimes how successful they'd become. I have a friend and he has a company with 200 employees. I have another friend that owns a number of restaurants and makes a huge living. And I remember when I was younger thinking, well, they have more than me or, you know, I, I used to know them growing up and they're so much more successful. And the person told me this very, very key lesson. You don't know what's really going on in their lives. Yes, maybe they have more money, but maybe they're not as happy. 
or maybe their relationship with their girlfriend or wife is not as good, or maybe they have a lot of anxiety, or maybe they're not fulfilled. So I want to say in your own life, walk your own path. Be your own person. Be true to who you are and what you're meant to do. And I think whatever created us, whether you believe in God or Source or whatever is out there, I think they created us to do what we're meant to do. Maybe my job is to help people with bipolar disorder, to write books and educate, and maybe your job is to be a dancer, or maybe your job is to you know, work two days a week. Whatever it is, that's okay. But you have to look at it and say, I'm willing to accept you know, who I am. I have to figure out what my strengths and weaknesses are. One of the main ways to do that is to think of what are you good at? What are some of the things that you're able to do either better than other people or that really come easy to you? Maybe you're a good speaker. Maybe you're good with computers. Maybe you're good with um, being creative. You know, figure out what your talents are and start to nurture them and work on them. Another great lesson I've learned is to be open to new experiences. Many times when we're hit with a mental illness, we feel like closing down. We don't want to meet new people. We don't want to go into new situations. We feel like we've almost been beaten up because it's so hard to be hospitalized or to you know, be feeling insecure. But when you start to get yourself healthy and you put yourself out there and you meet new people and you start to make friends or you go to a support group, what you're doing is you're allowing your life to get better. And unfortunately what I've seen is there's been a dramatic change in the way people communicate. I remember years ago, uh, we would all, my friends and I would talk on the phone every day or we'd go over each other's houses every day. And these days, even many clients text me and they say, hey, you know, can I call you today or can I call you tomorrow? People are on Facebook. But there is something very, very valuable about human contact, about going into a deli and saying, hey, you know, can I have a sandwich? Or going into a store and you know, buying a t-shirt or you know, going and being around other people. Because yes, it's good to communicate online and use some of those um, technologies, but you also have to have that one-on-one, -on -one, face to face interaction because there's something we get when we're with other people. When you can look someone in the eye and say, hi, you know, it's good to see you. And those support groups are a great tool. Wherever you live within a 30 mile radius, there is a support group near you. That means you know, that you can find others that will listen to you and support you and then know what you're going through. One of the hardest things to live with when you have a mental illness is that you're you know, alone, that you're not really around others that understand what you're living with. That doesn't have to be the end result for you. If you will go out there and meet other people and interact with them, you will feel so much better. I know myself, I go and do talks at a lot of these different support groups and a lot of locations, and it's such a great feeling being around others, You know, talking about my experiences. There's also many programs that they offer that allow you to share your story. Maybe you can, once you're healthy, help others. You know, there's a great value in being able to get through to through something and then going on and helping others who are in that situation. And part of why I wrote the book was I remember when I was sitting in the hospital and I was thinking, you know, am I going to get through this? Is my life over? And I was really sad because I had a lot of hopes and dreams and goals and passions earlier in my life and it was all gone. You know, when you're in five hospitals, you don't have any Thing. You know, you've lost pretty much all of the, the good that's come into your life. And I just remember thinking, you know, are there other people out there that, that have this? You know, do other kids go through this? And for a long time, I felt like I was the only one. But there are so many of us that live with these different situations and problems and go out there and meet others that are living with this. So you don't have to be isolated and alone because you're not doing anything wrong when you're diagnosed with a mental illness. It's a health condition like anything else. And the good news is the situation is improving. I feel very happy that if 40 years ago I was diagnosed and faced five hospitalizations and had delusions and paranoia, many of us with those uh, issues would be in a hospital for the rest of our lives. They didn't have medicines that could help us control our thinking and there were lots of people that were put in hospitals for years and years and years. The good news today is that's not how it is. Most of us that have a mental illness can get on medicine and have therapy and lead productive lives. I meet so many people that call me up with bipolar that are married, that have good jobs, that have friends, that are succeeding in their lives. I watch on television as uh, people become superstars. Demi Lovato, you know, just a few years ago was facing all these conditions, you know, bipolar and cutting and so many different issues. And now there she is on The Voice um, and she's, uh, you know, doing so wonderfully. Um, you know, and you can in your own life 
um, be able to succeed. By the way, I think it's not The Voice, it's actually uh, American Idol, but the point is she has music out there, she's creating stuff. You can in your own life achieve, and what we are doing when we admit to having it and we allow ourselves to be open, we're lessening the stigma. We don't have to be embarrassed or hide and, and feel like you know we have something wrong with us. And the truth is, if someone met you and they learned that you had bipolar, they wouldn't care, especially if you're working on it and you're getting yourself healthy. And one of the key things is to know that life improves when we work on things. If you just hope it'll get better or you know try to pretend like it's not really there, it doesn't usually improve. When you take the steps to work on your life, it makes your situation better. Now I know that some of you watching this might not have bipolar disorder. You might not be living with this condition. Maybe you have a friend or a family member or maybe you don't. The good news is when you work on your life, when you take steps to get yourself healthy, it makes a difference. Even all the tools that I share today, you can use it no matter what is happening in your life. Being able to exercise and take care of yourself and even getting a therapist to have an outlet. So many people in our modern society have a lot of stress and have a lot of situations that are hard to deal with. When you get someone there to help you and work with you, it gives you a great um, way to you know, improve your life. My wife had a very tough situation. Her mom and her were super, super close. In fact, they would talk five times a day, which I used to think was, wow, you know, that's so often to speak with your mother. But they really had a great close bond and loved each other very much. And sadly, my mother-in-law smoked cigarettes and had lung problems. She ended up getting very, very sick and she had to be on an oxygen tank for a number of years. And she ended up uh, we were told that she was losing her life and she was in the hospital. My wife went there and spent the last couple days with her mom and really helped her as she ended up passing away. Uh, but the key thing I said to my wife is, you don't have a mental illness and you don't have you know, the same thing I do, but you have to work on this. If you just pretend like you're okay and the loss that you're mourning is gonna get better, it'll be hard. And we have a child and we have a lot going on. I got her to go to therapy. She started working with someone. And what it did was really, really special. It gave her someone to understand her, to let out all the feelings, and she didn't have to worry. For example, if she were to say to me, oh, I'm feeling horrible. I don't know if I can continue in my life. I'm feeling like giving up. That would be really hard for me as her husband to hear. For a therapist, it's easy. That's what the therapist does for a living. They're able to handle that and work on the situation. So that's just one example of a healthy person that faced a stressful situation and using the benefits of therapy. In your own life, would you benefit from getting help? If you're in a school or you know in a job, you probably have the ability to find help. You know, many types of corporations offer uh, through their insurance you can find a therapist. Or if you're in school, they often have uh, guidance counselors or colleges have um, departments where you can find help. And one of the big things I've realized is we have to take steps to handle situations. A very alarming thing has happened in the U.S. in the last number of years. There's been these horrible school shootings. And I hate even mentioning it because it scares me and it scares anyone that you know works in a school or has children in a school. But the thing I feel is those kids that do those horrible things, they don't have support around them. They don't have people that care, and they don't figure out how to solve their problems. They figure that they're angry, or maybe people put them down, or whatever their justification is, rather than dealing in it with a healthy way and figuring out how to improve their life and you know get to be more stable, they take horrible action. And that impacts all of us. You know, I know myself, if I go to a movie theater, I have to think about that person that went in there and hurt people. And that makes it really, really sad because movies are a wonderful experience and we shouldn't even have to think that. When I send my child to school, I shouldn't have to worry that some child will go and hurt her there. Now, for all these reasons, it's important for all of us to improve our mental health. No matter where you are in your life, it's important to take steps. You know, if you see a child or someone that's really doing bad, go out there and offer them help. Say, listen, you know, you seem like things are hard. Do you need someone to talk to? Can I help you find you know, services? Can I help you figure out ways to improve your life? And sadly, this is the reality that we live in, but it impacts all of us, and I encourage you to take positive steps to make life better, because we are one community. It's a big world, but we're all impacted by each other. And when we help those with mental illness or without to make positive changes, we're helping ourselves because we all want to be in a society where we can walk around and be you know, safe and comfortable and not have to worry about these 
terrible things that have happened. And I think one of the key things, too, is many times we hear in the news, you know, he hurt someone and he's bipolar, or this person's going to jail and they're bipolar. And we have to know that that's not the only side of the coin. There are a lot of people out there that are doing well in their lives. There's many people that you never hear about that are just going about their lives and being successful. And my wife gave me one of the nicest compliments I've ever heard. She said, Blake, I wouldn't even know you're bipolar. If I didn't you know, know about your background and read your book and have you share all the things that happened, I wouldn't even know. And that's the best gift I can give you know, to my wife is that I want to be as healthy as possible. I want to be as normal as possible. I want to be just as good of a husband as anyone else. And there's a key thing that's really helped me in my life. There's been times when things are hard or I have a challenge, and I've always taken this and remembered it in my heart. Bipolar has actually been a very big gift for me. Because what it did when I was about 17 is it allowed me to look at all aspects of my life. Before I got diagnosed, I was successful in you know, achieving things, but I really wasn't a great person. I would put people down. I would you know, be kind of difficult. I had an attitude. I had an arrogance. I thought I was better than people. And that was a really bad thing. I wasn't a great person. Once I got diagnosed and I had to look at my life, I started to change who I was. I became nicer and caring, and I started helping other people, and I learned to be someone that's generous and, and kind to all people. What it's done is allowed me to become a better person and to help others and to learn that I can be the best possible person I am capable of. Another thing I've learned, even in a relationship, I try so hard with my friends and with my wife to be good and to help them and to listen and to minimize fighting and I now have a child and I love the fact that she has a great calm household where we're always having fun and enjoying each other and we don't yell a lot and have a stressful tense time and that's one of the best gifts I can give her because when I was a child it was stressful and there was you know screaming and yelling and fighting and she has not even experienced that and hopefully she never will so what I would say to you is if you or someone you love faces a mental illness it can end up making all of your lives better. By looking at ourselves and taking positive steps, we can find our situations improve. We can figure out how to be more alive. We can live in ways that are healthier. You know, just waking up every day and knowing that I should go out there and do exercise or try to eat well, you know, and have a positive attitude, it helps so much. Another one of the final things I want to share tonight is finding things that encourage you. Um, I am someone that believes that all faiths have value. I'm not here to say that one religion or way of thinking is the only way. I think that many of us you know, can find different ways to get ourselves to feel alive and, and be successful. And in my own life, I listen all the time to uplifting positive things because what that does is it surrounds me with positivity. It helps me to know that things are good. I have a choice of what I could let in. I could hear negative, nasty, fighting. I could put on the news and hear about all the horrible things, but I choose in my free time to be around things that are encouraging and uplifting and allow me to be happy. And I want to say to you, it's a choice. When you're in your car, you can pick what you listen to. When you're watching television, you can choose what type of programming you watch. When you're even um, you know, on your computer. There's all different options out there. And when you start making good choices and you surround yourself with good things, you'll see your situation improve. And I want to share one final story. Since I was a young boy, I always wanted to be involved in the arts. I wanted to write books and do documentaries. And I started this project called Rap Therapy, where I'd help foster care kids write hip hop, song, dance, and art. And it was really fun. I worked with the Salvation Army, and we would work on this, and I would teach them all these different um, lessons, and they would write song and dance and art about what they went through. And we had this great documentary. We interviewed 50 Cent and Russell Simmons and P. Diddy and Tom Cruise and all these people. And I ended up coming out to California. I was living in New York. And with a lot of positivity and persistence, I set up meetings with CBS and Fox and MTV and ABC. And what I learned was having that positive attitude. And even if someone said they weren't interested or I wasn't able to get a meeting, just pushing forward and having the energy and encouragement to just keep moving towards my dreams, it was allowing me to succeed. And in fact, the documentary is being released this month. You can find it online. And I, I've learned in my life 
when you have that encouragement and hope you can achieve anything even with my book it took 16 months from when i wrote it for the publisher to publish it but that positive just continuing and pressing forward allowed the book to come out and be a bestseller in its category so i want to say in your own life whatever your goals or dreams are whatever you want to do one day don't give up and believe in yourself and just keep pressing forward take small steps because many people are here and they want to get to the top and they want to just jump there. They think that they're going to instantly be successful. It very rarely works that way. If you'll just go slowly and steadily, right? And you'll eventually, within a few years, get to where you want to be. And that's one of the best lessons I can share is you have every possibility, no matter what you've been through, to lead a successful life. Having hope and having encouragement and having faith makes it so much easier and it'll make you happier. So I want to share that uh, I really thank you so much for watching this video. I also want to give you um, some information if you'd like to learn more about my work. Um, I have a website called uh, Bipolar Author Coach. Dot com. That's BipolarAuthorCoach.com where you can find out about the coaching that I do. Um, you can also find my book on any uh, website or it's also available in most stores. It's called Beating Bipolar. And please know that you don't you know, have to face this alone. And uh, with the right steps and the right uh, slow and steady mentality, you can overcome bipolar disorder and live a healthy and successful life.